they call that or something. I don't know if that's, that's really the right word for it. They're so concerned about that uh, global warming and that, uh, that ozone and stuff. But things are changing rapidly. For example, you see the death of, of communism. Communism was a polluter, you see. They're trying to reverse uh, 70 years of communist pollution over there. You can't do that overnight. Well, imagine how long it takes for 250, 300 years of capitalist pollution. But these things, these things take, take, take time. Not to mention the pollution of the airways by the lobbyists, and I'll be the first to admit it. We out there spewing, because it's important to spew, and I'll tell you why. Because if you spew enough, it's like the machine gun effect. One of your spews gonna hit the target. I don't mean to personally mention anybody here as target, but I have said a lot of things here tonight. One or two of them was bound to hit the mark. Have I converted anyone here tonight? I want you to test it. Hey, 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 I want it. What's the question? Now, let's mention, I talked about the cows. People are very concerned down there in, uh, in Brazil at that meeting about converting to alternative energies. And I've already done a study on this. They're saying that the coal and the oil is, is putting out too much of these greenhouse gases. Uh, it's fine, I agree with that, but you must be careful which energies you convert to. For example, oil is widely used in the cars, which creates, uh, well, Los Angeles. <laughs> now, not all of those rides. Yes, some of them would raise two dollars. Hope you but in general, there's air. You know, and I never breathe anything that I can't see. But you see, the ozone hole is vastly overrated. If you can't position that ozone hole over Los Angeles and set up a battery of fans, they're strategically, and you can blow all those gases right out of it, and real quick seal that up, which is crazy glue, you see. <laughs> but then they say, well, you can keep your automobiles, but let's not put the oil and the gas in there. Let's put the alcohol in it. Alcohol fuel. That's wrong. You see? Alcohol. <laughs> no, we're in a place here where I think I can speak freely. Alcohol is for people. <laughs> right now. They're organizing the largest solar entrapment unit in the country to give that energy and those rays in order to provide those to the other people who are not, they're, they're unfortunate, you see, they can't afford their own uh, sun, you see. But as a, <laughs> as we're going into the solar era, you must be very prudent. And you must never look directly at the sun. And you must never directly entrap the sun's rays. You must always filter that through a, the, the corporation, you <laughs> <laughs> I want to, uh, and also, it's very important to control change. Change must be very, very tightly regimented. You can't just go off half car. For example, with the wet wings here. I was up in the James Bay area up there, and they, did you know there's rivers up there that feed down into the James Bay, and then the water goes out into the ocean, goes to other countries without us even getting that hydro power. That's American water. I thought about that. I was standing there looking down at that raging river there, and I said, damn it, and they did. You know, and that's very important <laughs> because you must use that water, not just let that go up a little bit of whatever the water, water please, you see. But when you have these changes, you must control it, the wetlands. Now, the wetlands, that's an example of that problem of erosion. Erosion of property rights, you see. <laughs> right to dry up your personal wet space, you see. <laughs> wet up somebody's dry space, it what goes around, come around. You know, like John Muir said, all things is hitched together. John told me that again last week. He's always telling me that. And that's very important to understand those connections, and that's why I want to talk to you just briefly now about the forest out in the West, because when I went out there and met with those people, I told them nature is a wonderful thing, but nature's a mess. <laughs> we got to organize that a little bit. <laughs> nature's a wonderful thing, but it can never do what man can do, and that is to create a theme park. You <laughs> see, <laughs> you people here in Columbus, you know a little bit about, about that because when Columbus discovered Ohio, he knew, <laughs> he knew he had a theme park on his hands. It might take 200 feet, 500 years, but he was going to get that theme park. <laughs> we got a little theme park 
out west. And actually, they named that for me. It's called Stumps of Mystery. <laughs> and uh, I, I feel moved to sing a theme song from the theme park there. Uh, because, uh, because it's just such a beautiful thing. <laughs> would y'all like that? I thought you would. <laughs>
95% of the people in the world consume one third of its resources and produce almost half the non-organic waste. Those people are us.
uh, I really thought I was carrying on with the traditions of the 60s. Well, I was into personal growth through intimidation. <laughs> and I was very concerned about excessive energy use, so I uh, had my electric hot tub taken out, put in an acoustic one. <laughs> and I fought for self determination for my minority community. The right to self defense against, against the other half. The right to have more and have my world. The right to be rich in the city. Well, I had to live in the city, being at a health club where you're going to go running in the country for a life. And also, of course, <laughs> the most important right of all is the right to relax. You know, I first got on the fast track when I invented the automatic suntan oil spray. Oh, well, you might remember. Ow! <laughs> Tan without turning. <laughs> Full body rotisserie. <laughs> Hard to believe I was a hippie. Back in the old days, when there was a lot of protests, December and all that, but I, and eventually it all just came to seem like some kind of social disease to me because frankly there was, a, there was no money in it. So I decided to pull myself up by my brother's bootstraps and rise above him. So I went into business, got into stocks and bondage, all that kinky stuff. <laughs> I believed in a revolution, the Reagan revolution. At the height of my career, I owned a large microchip factory in a small Caribbean island. Uh, I'll never forget the first time I saw that island in the battle of my Mercedes. I landed there, and I saw that the place was empty, well, except for the people living there, but uh, well, they were all running around in their underwear, which didn't have any names on it. So I took possession of Dominator with pride, because I had a dream of a great Microchip factory. We would sell billions worldwide. We would outsell Mrs. Fields. So within a year, peasants were revolting. And then I had to get a. And uh. Job. Well, about this time, I, uh, I had this feeling I wanted to do something for humanity, you know, kind of lessen our dependence on foreign oil. So. <laughs> I went to work for a friend of mine who was manufacturing solar-powered nuclear battleships. <laughs> and unfortunately, he, uh, it turned out that he was uh, doing drugs. So, uh, well, he didn't have any kids, so, uh, so I had to turn to him. Now, at this point, <laughs> I was very well positioned to become chief executive officer of the company, but they got a bargain CEO in South Korea, pulled the Persian rug right out from under me. It was the end of my brilliant career in appropriate technology, military, and contracting. It gave me my golden parachute, and I was living under that until I decided to go into stocks. That was in uh, September. It was 87. I know it was, I know it was on Friday. Anyhow, anyhow, that's when I really began to slide. And I, I became one of a growing number of people sliding lower and lower out of the upper middle class into the lower middle class. People who just woke up one morning and discovered that they're their croissant was empty. <laughs> we are the downwardly mobile, not so young, urban post profession. <laughs> We're the numbers. <laughs> now, we are not yet a stereotype, but we are a trend, or at least the increasing perception of the growing probability of a trend towards a stereotype. Uh, like all social groups, we have our support group, we call it Dumps on Us. <laughs> we have regular meetings about our feelings, our problems, our children. Talk about, well, we can role play. I had to play, last week I had to play the yucky. That's very painful. Because, you know, you get into your former head. There's like, nothing there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, towards the end of it all, I, I guess I got the idea to go back in time, back to the land, and back to visit the log cabin that I built for myself back in the 60s, built by hand, out of used chopsticks. <laughs> Worn down by the daily use of long-handed brown rice. The 60s. If I had known it was going to be an era, I would have paid more attention to <laughs> Anyway, I went back there. It was hard to find. I drove, and I drove, and finally I found it. It was out behind the condominium, next to the toxic waste barrels. And I guess for sentimental reasons, I, I got the idea to buy one of the condominiums as opposed to one of the toxic waste barrels. So I went over to the sales office. It turned out to be one of my old company. Well, what do you think they did? They turned out my references. I rejected my own credit. And so you see, that's how I came to be a dummy. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
And I make no mistake, a dumpy is a dumpy. A former debris box, a former big cheese becomes a debris box. I have you blown that line for you special tonight. <laughs> I'd like to thank you so much for hearing my sad story, and I hope that it happens to all of us. <laughs> Thank you. 